are talking about judgment, but not because we do topical stuff. We're actually, we're studying the book of Jude, and it's a letter that was written to followers of the way around 65 A.D., and in this letter, which all of the books of the New Testament are simply letters written to followers of the way, wherever they were meeting, in this letter, Jude discusses the day of judgment. So we just stopped and I decided, you know what, there are certain things that when we talk about, I don't think we know as much about it as we should. And our faith is very much based upon certain pillars. One of them is there will be a day of judgment when Christ returns. But I, I think that most people, and when I say most people, I, I believe that most of us um, fall under, we're like-minded, the scripture says, that the same things I feel, you feel, the same things that they felt, then we feel. And I think that many of us, judging from the conversations I've had throughout the years, and if I'm being transparent, and I'm trying to be, just myself, we have a problem with the entire concept of judgment. That within the church, but really within the Western culture at large, there's a problem with Christ returning. People don't really like that, but I'm going to say this. You cannot celebrate or even accept what we celebrated last week, Easter, without looking forward to Christ's return, without looking forward to it. And so I would say this, if we're not looking forward to Christ's return, then we have misunderstood. And so on behalf of those who might have stood up here and represented it in ways that we should not have had, I'd, I want to ask for your forgiveness on behalf of those who may have misrepresented something so I don't even know how to put it. So critical is Christ's return. We can't accept Easter without looking forward to it because the resurrection, it actually brought what? Life. The resurrection brought life. The, the resurrection defeated the elements that were introduced into this world through our rebellion, death, and decay, and the inevitable results of such things like sadness and mourning, relational distance, those things were defeated by Christ on Easter Sunday. And yet when we think of Christ's return, we still think in terms of death and punitive and not restorative because his return actually, well, guess what? His return will defeat those things forever. And it's going to restore everything to the way that it had been intended. But that's not how it's viewed typically. Christ's return is viewed typically as primarily punitive. And, and I want to say this because um, one of the things that's been freeing for me is to not try to argue or debate every voice in your head that I hear in my own. I'm not going to try to argue all of them, so let me just say this. I am not saying that there is not judgment that is going to be terrible for some people. Can we just agree with that? I, I would ask if you just said yes to that, how does it impact your life when you leave here? I would say that if you really believe in, in such a thing, that do you live out the process of restoring this world now as God is restoring you? But that's not for today. That's another day. But I, I would say we're not going to talk about that as much. It's there, but to view it all as punitive it would be to be doing such a disservice to what Christ has promised. His return, his primary purpose is... is viewed typically to punish and not restore. Or, or, or how about this? Or a day of judgment is viewed as evidence of a God who is simply mean. I've heard that. It's just a mean, critical God. A, a God who's primarily passionate about rules. And he's intent upon ensuring that those who break them, break his rules, his arbitrary rules, are punished. But, but I would say this to those who have this intellectual issue that they think they've come up with or is new that if evil exists or if God punishes, then he must be blah, blah, blah. There's nothing new under the sun. You do realize that, right? That all of this has been said before, but I would say that if there is no day of judgment, if in here you would prefer there not be a day of judgment, then God is exactly what people have accused him of being as they look at this world and all of its suffering. If, if there is no day of judgment, you're right. Then God is absent at best, and he is evil at worst if there is no day of judgment. And even more personally, and I've said this time and time again, I crave to be restored. And I know I stand up here, and there is a, um, 
There is a tendency by the very way we're set up, which Spencer and I, if you guys were to come in here, our heated discussions, and that's all they are. Some of you were raised in a different family than ours. You would think we were arguing, but we're just really hammering stuff out. And one of the things I say is I hate this model. Is that okay to tell you? I, I hate it, which is why I do stupid things and, and why I joke and why I want it to feel like a living room. I want it to feel like I am in front of the physician just like you guys are. Now, I've been called to a different role, but we all have the same goal, which is restoration. And I realize as you guys come and you see me by the very nature up here, I'm here, you're there. Some of you who don't know me may be tempted to think, oh, Don's got it all together. But let me tell you, I crave to be restored maybe more so than those but my most intimate friends and my wife know. I crave to be restored. I hate things about me. Do you guys? When Spencer said that he's a piece of garbage and, you know, this, and some of your religious folk are like, oh, don't say that. You've been miraculous. He knows all that. In fact, he's like me. The reason I can come up and tell you guys, man, I, I hate myself sometimes. I hate things about myself is because I realize I'm fully and totally accepted and loved by Jesus Christ. I don't have to fake it. I don't have to put artifices on so somehow you think I've got it together. I'm working on this, and there's some things, man, I'm in the program. I've gotten down much better than if you would have saw me 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. But I can tell you, this is how it happens with me, and maybe it's with you. And I crave to be restored personally. I hate things about myself that I am just me. I hate some of them, and I even tell my wife sometimes, I, I wish I were different. This is who I'm stuck with. This is, this is, whether it's a physical melody or just, this is, a, why do I come across this way when I don't want to be seen that way? And, and, but here's the flip side. It keeps going, right? And then I realize I hate the fact that I hate myself. <laughs> you ever been there? You, it's just a whole thing. It's just like, I hate this about me. Why did I do it again? Why did I think that? Why did I do that? How did I act like that? And then I hate that I am depressed and hate myself. Guys, I crave to be restored, don't you? The day of restoration, the day of judgment, I crave to be set free from the things which enslave me. I hate it. I hate the things like anger that comes up, insecurities, self-centeredness, insensitive thoughts, intrusive thoughts. And I'll even say this. If I've ever had an awkward interaction with anybody in here where you're like, well, that, he was kind of a jerk. Trust me, I still live with it at 2 a.m. and every morning. Don't you? Don't you just wake up or go and go, why did I do that? You didn't even mean that. Why'd you try? That wasn't funny. Spencer and I were talking. I left Dutch Brothers the other day, and I was on full dawn, right? So a little bit, I, I worked with uh, my boss one time when I was a manager. He told me uh, at Target Distribution Center, he told Hi, Robert. Remember those days, Bob? Right? Bob, here's what, uh, here's what our big boss told me one day in a meeting amongst all the bosses. He said, you know, a little bit of dawn goes a really long way. <laughs> and I, I tell you, but you guys know something? I know that about me, and do you know I hate that? I hate it. I've told some of you, some of you guys, when I, and I'm going to do it too again today, when I preach more than I want to preach in the message, but I'm just having so much fun with you guys, I've told you guys, I literally feel shame and loathing when I see I've went over 45 minutes. I, when I go over, I feel shame. I, I'm just, that's me. I'm not asking for everybody to come hold my hand. No, 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 stop. Don't you guys have weird hangups? And you don't know where you picked them up? Was it your dad? Was it a pastor? Was it somebody? Yes, it was all those people. I'll, there's a list of names that you can have out there. But my point is, and I'll get to it, guys, I crave to be set free from that. I crave to be more like I feel when I'm just doing this, where I just know you love me and I love you and, and we've come together because we all love Jesus and we recognize he loves us so much. But I say that to say that I am oppressed. I'm oppressed. I, and I've said my point, I'm not just wandering through this, although most of it wasn't written down. My point, which I've stated repeatedly, is that we need to view the day of judgment differently than most of us have in the Western world. We need to view it first, I've said as this, as restorative. It, this thing is a day of restoration. We don't need to apologize for the fact that God will also make things right in his own way. And that there will be people on that day that... It's a great and yet terrible day. We don't need to apologize for God, 
But I can tell you for those of us in here, we should be craving and living our lives to get people to move from this side to this side, right? If we believe it, from a terrible day to a great day, we should view it as restorative, but we should also always view it through the eyes of the oppressed. Because we tend to think we're not oppressed. In fact, I would say that one of the reasons, and this is my opinion only, that we in the Western world and in America, we don't like the idea of judgment because we feel like we're kind of culpable. We like how we do our stuff. We, we understand that we're not really all in, that we have much more power and much more comfort, many more amusements. To muse is to consider deeply. You put the letter A, it means a lack of it. We don't spend a lot of time thinking and pondering God very deeply. And we're aware of that, I think, my opinion is, which is why we don't like the Day of Judgment. So let me tell you again, make no mistake about it, you are oppressed. We just spent five minutes laughing at my oppression, but I hope you laughed as those who suffer also, or else you're just mean. <laughs> which is why we say in here, we don't show up. So some of you, I, I saw a lot of new faces in here, it's starting to make me panic. We started off with nine, remember those days? Nine on a Saturday night, and I used to wander the parking lot, and now I'm thinking, could some of you maybe go to River of Life? It's a wonderful <laughs> church. It's, um, it's great. Colton's a great guy. There's other, Well, because my, my, my point is, and I want to say this out loud, uh, many of the things that started us that we clung to were so easy are going to be harder to deliver as we grow, isn't it? Is that just, isn't that true? So I'm prepared for that, but I'm, I'm here to say something I, I don't know what I was going to say. Where was I at here? Oh, um, I have no idea. All I did was tell you to leave. That's a weird spot to... Ugh! I had surgery. Did I... How long can I do that? Michelle says it's been eight months. That's long enough. John, is eight months long enough for open heart surgery? I got a few. Thank you. All right. We need to view it through the eyes of the oppressed because you know who never has a problem with judgment? You know who never has a problem with the king returning with justice in hand to put everything right, to punish the evildoers, to break the chains? The oppressed. And our problem is we don't view ourselves as the oppressed. Trust me, you're oppressed. The things that enslave you, the things that you don't want to be, the, the shame you feel, the insecurities you feel, you're oppressed. I'm oppressed. But I've said this, it would be really strange for Jesus to speak of a day of judgment without telling us what we will be judged upon. It would be kind of evil, wouldn't it? It'd be kind of weird for him to go, you're going to be judged, now figure it out. <laughs> it's not who he is. If scripture is full of everything we need to know to thrive. In fact, I'm going to give you the very last sentence of the entire message because I feel like it and you can't stop me. Here we go. Do you know that every one of God's commands, do you know every one of Christ's admonitions were designed to increase our pleasure and multiply our joy, not restrict it? I guess I'm talking to the body. I want you guys to, to if this is not how you view it, then you need to start viewing it this way. I'll say it again. I'll, I'll say it later. So, Did you know that every one of, Christ, of God's commands, all of Christ's admonitions, were designed to increase our pleasure and multiply our joy, not restrict it? We need to understand. Thank you. She said, that's good. I stole it, I'm sure. Oh, then I must have stole it. Unless you come in as a believer understanding that God's commands... The admonitions of Christ, aligning our lives with the way that Jesus said to live, that this is the best way. If, if you think that somehow you're being held back from something better, you have a problem. And, and, and we need to, in here, let's just say, as this little adventure of life point, that we're always going to lean into Jesus because we think that's the best life. We're not being cheated of anything. In fact, we want other people to come along. So let me go back to where I was here. Jesus gave us what we will be judged upon. And so we're looking at, for those of you who bring your Bible, and when you do that, we're in Matthew 25, and we're going to start off in 31. And we've been looking where Jesus says what we will be judged upon. And, and if the context of it is not going to be complete today, it's online, so please go back and you can find it on there. How many of you guys ever look at our stuff online? Because I'm looking to cut Barry's paycheck. Is it? <laughs> Raise your hand tall. Is it still worth it? Get a reprieve. One more month, Barry. 
So let's review. Jesus in this passage, and you don't have to put it up yet, Jesus in this passage reveals that you will be judged upon what you did with your calling. And we said your calling is what you and you only can meet. The people in your life, the situations that are unique to you. How are you dealing with the situation that if you were to be removed, no one else could answer that call? How are you doing? He said you're going to be, you will be judged on what you have uh, with the knowledge of Jesus which you have been given. That I said that, that information is opportunity. And every one of you have the same information, therefore everyone has the same opportunity. And you will be judged on what you did with the knowledge that you've been given. Don't worry about these theological or theoretical or hypothetical situations. What about the individual in the Congo? What, 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 you will be judged upon the information about Jesus you have been given. Jesus said as much. Number three, he said, you're going to be judged what you do with your gifts. Um, Spencer, and I say this, has been gifted with uh, the gift of, of whatever you want to call musical ability, leading people into worship. Um, I believe, or I wouldn't be up here, that I've been gifted with the gift of teaching. I still find myself looking at some of you, and I go, man, I want that one. Wouldn't it be great to have that one? It's not the same ones as when I was older, or when I was younger. Now it's, I wish I had Glenn and Shauna's gift to just see a need, fill a need, go, I, I want to be that. But I had surgery. <laughs> You're the only guy who can say that, Rick. I'll take it from you. Oh. No, but my point, is, my, my point is, I won't be judged upon what you guys did with your gifts. I'll be judged with what I did with mine. And we said some of those gifts, absolutely. Some of those gifts are physical. Some of those gifts are spiritual. Some of those things are what you've been given financially. Your house, your car. I mean, everything is from God. So that's why he said, what is your spiritual form of worship? Your life. Everything returning to him. But then Jesus wraps up this portion with the most crucial point of judgment, which is Matthew 25, 31 through 46. We'll read it here. You can choose your own scripture that you have in front of you or right here. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him. Holy, holy is the Lord. That's the song. Okay? And He will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And this is huge. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in naked, and you clothed me. Remember that. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And, and when did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels, for I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in naked, and you did not clothe me sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or, or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, I want to be very clear that there are many things, as you guys who understand and study Scripture, that we could get from this, correct? 
We could spend the next five or six months, and some of you think I probably will. I won't. But I want to say that what I'm going to say today is no less true than something we would find tomorrow or the next day. And so what I'm going to say is that you will be judged, this is the fourth thing, upon what you did with your vocation. And let me flesh this out for you. You see, in the spiritual sense, your vocation encompasses every role within your life. It's, it's not just what you do, it's, it's who you are and what you were called to do, where you get your spiritual meaning, where you get everything that's good. We say, well, doing that is your vocation. It gives your life purpose. It gives you the meaning behind your calling. It's the reason for your gifts that you were given. And every one of us, although we may have a different calling, we may be in different situations where we are called to minister. Every one of us, while we may have different gifts, and surely we do, or else the body would be inefficient, would it not? We've all been given different gifts. All of us have different callings, but I can say this. All of us have the same vocation. Every one of us do. You see... We say stuff for years, and we don't even understand necessarily all that it entails, and we say things like this, we were created in God's image. And we don't, where's my water? Can somebody bring me my water for some reason? It's right there next to Barry. Barry, is that your water to your left? Is that my water? Okay, I'm going to keep talking. Somebody find my water! (laughs) Or a water will work. Is this, oh, Spencer, I'll just drink your water. I'll just, Spence, I got yours. All right, here we go. <laughs> Tequila? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't know. I mean, something other than water. <laughs> Whiskey. Let's go back to this. God created us in his image, and we say that all the time, but let's just move along. That God created us in his image, and, and he, why did he do it in the first place? And so I, I debated doing this because I always do it, but here's what I thought. I'm not very smart about some stuff, so when I find something that sounds smart, I'm going to repeat it, right? That, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were in this time-eternal dance of relationship. Do you understand that? They were in this dance of relationship, and for whatever reason, for his own pleasure, God paused this moment for just a minute to, to create us for relationship and place us on this earth in his image for relationship with him. And it's actually a world that was uniquely crafted for us. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just for example, I'll just say some of this. Did you know that the world and the way, it's astronomical that the way this world is designed would allow us to even live, much less survive and thrive? I just have a couple of them. I mean, you might be interested. It is just the right distance from the sun so that water is warm enough to melt but not so hot as to boil. It's a big deal, and there's more there. It is in an inhabitable zone in the galaxy. Radiation, the presence of wandering planetoids, make life closer to the center of the gravity, g- galaxy unlikely. It wouldn't live out there. It is in orbit in a nearly perfect circle rather than an eccentric, whatever. The orbit is perfect. What's happening is um, I'm having right now for the second week in a row an aura migraine. Anybody get that? Where your head doesn't hurt, but everything looks like cracked glass. I crave to be restored. (laughs) It's molten core and volcanism generate magnetic fields or belts that protect it from the most harmful rays of the sun. The sun is just the right kind of star, putting out a fairly steady amount of energy. Its fairly rapid rotation reduces the daily variation in temperature, makes photosynthesis possible. Its axis is tilted just enough relative to the orbital plane to allow seasonal variations that allow complex life. Its moon causes tides tides that are just large enough to permit tidal waves and, you know what, to keep other things up. It has two nearly, you've thought about this, two nearby gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn, which attract and catch so many of the wandering things we don't want hitting us. And there's more, and there's more, and there's more. I'm just saying, this place was designed for us. It was created for us to not just survive, but to thrive. And I would challenge any of you to go ahead and and give me the astronomical predictions that you would debate me with. But that's for another day. I don't want to get into that as much as I want to say this. He put us here in his image. And what it meant to have his image truly 
is that we were called to live, as I've said before, like angled mirrors. And, and, and I got this from a, um, a smart guy years ago, and then I've fleshed it out so much that I don't even know if he could sue me for plagiarism, right? I've changed it enough. But, but the idea of angled mirrors is, I loved it, and so I just took it. And, because if you think about our original purpose, here's what we were designed to do. We were designed to reflect God's heart to the world, were we not? That we were called to use His wisdom, His priorities, His passions, and to really have all, everything under dominion of us. And if we're reflecting and using all that God has and has given us, then everything beneath us would thrive because we're reflecting God's image to the world. And then like angled mirrors, you cannot live a life where you are living in such close communion with God and having all of the beauty of creation reflected back at you that you don't return praise to God. Angled mirrors, that was our vocation to reflect to the world God's heart, His priorities, His passions, His love, and then to reflect back to God the joyful thanksgiving the praise that such a life naturally manifests. And so, those of us in Christ, guess what we are called to do? To return to our original vocation. Too many people, and you need to hear this, and if you're religious, if if this applies to you, you're going to know what it means because you're religious. Too many people in here want to return to the temple. We're headed back to the garden. I don't need more rules. I need to live in an unfettered relationship with God. I don't need more constraints or gatekeepers keeping me from him at a distance. I want to walk with Jesus freely. We're going to the garden. We're not heading back to the temple. Is that for my migraine? Bless you, child. You think we'll have migraines in heaven? No, you won't. So I want to say this. Those of us in Christ are called to return to our original vocation. You're called to use your relationships, you're calling. You're called to use your personal knowledge of Christ. You're called to use your God-given gifts to display God's heart to the world. That's your vocation. God's love, His pursuit, His passion for people. You see, we far too often constrain and restrict our ideas of our faith to theological observations or religious holidays and commemorations. I will say this, that is not God's preference. We are called to reflect God's love and His pursuit and His passion for people to people. That's our vocation. And I know this bothers some people, But there is an inescapable connection between faith and works. I love stressing people out. There is an inescapable connection. There there just is between faith and works. In fact, I would say that there are actually these two things are two pillars of truth within Christianity. And some of you guys, you have a huge issue with this between faith and works. Paul, though, he put it this way. You are justified by faith. Agreed? You are returned to a right standing, that relationship, that garden relationship. You return to a right standing with God through God's grace. You cannot earn it. There's nothing you can do to earn it. I can tell you, please stop. It's troublesome at best, or at worst, and it's destructive. And at worst, it's horrible to live thinking somehow that you have to reflect God's standard for God to accept you. You cannot earn it. You are justified by faith, but you will be judged. You will be judged according to your works. Oh, no! Some of you don't like to hear that. Well, stick around to the end. You you could walk out, but that'd be awkward for you because I'll call you out. (laughs) You will be judged, Paul writes, according, so if you don't like it, I'll give you Paul's email, and you can send it to him, and maybe he'll have a response. And and I know it bothers some of you, but it certainly didn't bother the apostles. Paul wrote of faith and works through love. Look at Galatians 5, 6. Faith and works through love. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, which is Jewish, uh, Gentile, means anything. But faith, doing what? Complacently sitting. 
comfortably viewing from your couch. But faith working through love. He speaks of works of faith. 1 Thessalonians 1.3. It's just a letter he wrote to a church at Thessalonica. Constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and, oh, labor of love. Just sitting back. Just sitting back and enjoying the bounties, doing nothing. Absolutely not. You will be judged if you don't. Well, let's see what he keeps saying here. I love what he wrote to the followers of the way in Philippi. So one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Philippians 2, 12. Work out your, work out your salvation with what? Fear and trembling. What is inside of you is so magnificent and great that you need to work it in what direction? Out. And it is so incredible, it will cause a response. This thing is big. You see, what is truly within you... I'm talking to all you husbands out there. Here we go. Who just moaned? Was that Dave Bauer? That was Dave? I heard... Oh, Here we go, Dave. The rest of you can just look at Dave. Apparently, God put him here today for a special purpose. You see, what is truly within you will work its way out of you. In a marriage, it is not enough to say... I love you. That is proof of nothing, is it? I can tell you what proof is. Proof is when I love my wife, it manifests itself in behaviors in my life. I'm not saying that every behavior is proof, but I am saying the absence of behaviors is definitely proof. If I lo- There you go. Dave, you and Robert are going to meet every Thursday. He's going to... What is in you truly will work its way out of you James, um, he made the most clear statement of this truth when he wrote one of the most controversial statements in the Bible. Because of this statement, it's one of the major reasons that people thought about whether or not we should even include James in the canon of Scripture until the second century. We didn't even, we disagreed. It might have been the fourth century. That was two weeks ago. Check it out. Point being, it was disputed. And one of it was his statement he makes right here in James 2, 15 through 18. And tell me though... Leave it up. If this doesn't sound vaguely familiar to what Jesus said, if a brother or sister is without clothing, naked, in need of daily food, hungry, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? It goes on, doesn't it? Thank you. Even so, faith. If it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will say, I will show you my faith by my works. Is that it? That's it. That's it. I'll show you my faith by my works. I, I wrote this in your not a bulletin. Now it went back to being a uh, bookmark. And I don't know how I phrased it there, but here's what I put here. Actions complete faith. In any relationship, if you're in here and all you do is say, I have, I have, I have, I feel, I feel, I feel, and it never makes its way into your life in the presence of a manifested behavior, it doesn't create a behavior, I will say that you have not, there's a gap. There's a gap in your life in that relationship. If you say, I believe, I love, I adore, I do, but you don't do, Trust me, you may not feel the gap. Your spouse, your children feel the absence of the truth, don't they? Faith, in the same way, viewed as relationship, not rules, our relationship with Jesus will always naturally manifest behaviors. Actions complete faith. But isn't James just echoing what Jesus said in Matthew? Didn't he just say, when someone is naked, when someone is hungry... By doing this, you're going to show, you're going to be judged upon those works. You will be judged by your behaviors, your deeds. And I'm sorry, but I'll just say this. You're going to be judged by the works present in this one and only life which you have been given. And here's where some of you, even those who agree with me at first, are like, I think you're hitting this too hard. So let me just bring up what Paul had to say. Romans 2, 6 and 13. The righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his spoken faith, according to what he wishes. 
his deeds. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. And it's within a greater, it's with, is there more? Okay, it's within a greater context where he's talking about some stuff. But do you know why those of us, if you're still nervous, and I wanted you to be, I tried to make you guys nervous. I really did. I'm trying to make you guys feel a little uncomfortable over some of this. So let me say this. Do you know why those of us who cling desperately, and rightfully so, to God's grace, and let me say this, I've said it too often, but I mean this. If you in here are suspicious of grace, if somehow you're like, I don't know about that grace thing, I don't trust you. I will always be suspicious of people who claim to be believers who are suspicious of grace. It bothers me. I'm thinking, ah, you must think you're better than me. <laughs> and you may be, but you ain't better than God or nearly close as God. You desperately need God's grace. So I will say this. Do you know why those of us who cling, and rightfully so, desperately to God's grace are bothered by being judged by works? Because we misunderstand works. I'm just, I'm pleased with myself, even if you're not. <laughs> Look at Philippians 1, verse 6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Back to judgment. Who began the work? Jesus. Who's working? Jesus. You see, we misunderstand when we think of works. We misunderstand what it means to be a believer. It is an act. I will say this. It is 100% an act of our will to get this ball rolling sometimes, is it not? But I will say this. Even the smallest step will be met with the most furious response by the Holy Spirit. It is an act of my will assisted, carried, completed by the Holy Spirit. In fact, let me put it this way. It's our faith completed by God's action that is the work. That when I said that this whole idea on your bulletin there, that, that actions are the necessary... Com what I say? Somebody say, what, what's it say? Actions are the natural culmination of faith. I'm saying that for us, but I'm flipping it now and saying, listen to this. It is our faith completed by God's action. It's not on me transforming us, empowering us, restoring us, equipping us to return to our intended purpose, to live as angled mirrors, to have this vocation, to reflect God's heart to the world. Some of you are trying too hard. Isn't that a weird thing for somebody to say? Rick and I in private would say, some of you aren't trying hard enough. Is that not true also? But I'm talking to the religious in us, the ones like Spencer said, who we know... Those of us who live, I'm, ah, I'm a piece of garbage, he called it. Me, I hate myself sometimes. Some of us try too hard, don't we? We live in that and we have to escape it. We can't, we run from the truth of it is, that is the beginning of my knowledge of Christ. It's met, it's met when I say, I desperately need you with him. Right here, right here, here we go, let's go. And he says in this passage that he calls us, that he gives us, he equips us with knowledge, he equips us with gifts. And then he says, why? So that you will pursue your vocation. We are the initial acts of restoration. Isn't that beautiful? Some of you, are you all Baptists? Did you follow me for my childhood? That, do you understand what I said? You, us, the church, we are his initial steps into this broken world we are the initial acts of restoration. Thank you. To live with that knowledge is incredible. And I'm not even Pentecostal. Sorry, Rick. I know, I'm always, I got you guys get right up front. I always know, they always flank me up here. And I love you for it, thank you. So let me tell you this, I'm going to give you something that should sound quite obvious. You and I are called to reflect God's heart to the world, are we not? I'm going to say something that should be very obvious. Did you know that you cannot reflect God's heart if you do not possess God's heart? You cannot. So God, who created you, who gives you, who equips you, He invites you back into the relationship. But it is your choice. And Jesus said you will ultimately be judged 
Here we go, back to the future, back to the beginning. You will ultimately judge at the end of this thing, he said, by your own choice, to accept Christ's offer or not. But no one ever, ever flourished or thrived in relationship because they came back afraid of the abuse within that relationship. Nobody ever survived or thrived in a relationship they went back to because they were afraid. So let me say this that you may have heard earlier. Did you know that every one of God's commands and every one of Christ's admonitions were designed to increase our pleasure and multiply our joy, never to restrict it? Did you know that God is good? Did you know that God is good? Did you know that Christ is absolutely inviting us into a relationship where all good things abound? Did you know that Christ has invited you? And for some of you who are nervous, I'm going to do an altar call and you didn't come for that. I'm not today. And some of you are mad about that. I can't win for losing. What I do want you to hear is the theme of today from Spencer, what the Holy Spirit put on him to what the Holy Spirit put on me, which is God is good. And everything he has done, including his promised return, will be good for those who believe it. Because if you believe it, it will play a part in your life. And if it plays a part in your life, it will play a part in your family. And you will begin to spread the kingdom, which is here, he said, when he showed up. You'll begin to extend the borders of this kingdom by one person. And you'll venture out across the lines that are held by the enemy tenuously, although he acts as if he holds them, he holds them with hard hands. He cannot... And we will enter into enemy territory every day, extending the kingdom of God because we are the initial acts of restoration. And yes, as we finish this and go back to Jude, and please show up next week, two more in Jude, then we're heading not to Revelations as some of you guys wanted, but to Matthew. When we go the next two weeks, I want you, if you show up next week, to spend this week asking yourself, what has it meant to you and those around you as you have been restored? And then to ask further, how do you view the day of restoration? Are you nervous about it? I would say that's for you to decide. I'm a little nervous because I don't know everything it's going to entail. But I can tell you, I am sick and tired of hating myself. And I am so desperate to feel God's love wash over me in a way that every bit of the vestige of my insecurities falls away. And I hear him say on that day, well done, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into everything I've prepared for you. And I want every one of you on the other side of that thing to be high-fiving. I don't want a single one of us or those you love to miss out on it.